I would ask that you turn with me to Titus. Titus chapter 3 is where our, our study will come from this morning. And our title is Things Worth Remembering. In our Scripture reading, we heard Peter tell the brethren to whom he was writing, it is good for me to remind, to write to you and to remind you of the things. The writers in the New Testament acknowledge, you already know this. These are things you've been taught and told and you believe them, yet you should be reminded. And so we'll look this morning. This is the theme of the lesson. These are things worth remembering in Titus Chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. I think it's important, before we read this passage, because of all that's happening for Titus here, he has been given a very difficult job to do on the island of Crete. He was left, by, left there by Paul to set in order the things that were lacking. Uh, during the time that he received this letter, Titus was in the middle of appointing elders in every city as Paul had commanded him to do. In chapter 1, Paul urges Titus to finish that work. He's going from city to city on the island of Crete, and his job, his responsibility before God, and certainly before the Apostle Paul, is to appoint elders in every church. And, and there's a great challenge in all of that. It's not just a matter of going and saying, all right, let me see all the men, you know, line them up, let me, let me talk to them. Uh, there's more happening, as there always is in life. The churches in Crete are in great spiritual danger because the island is known to have men who are insubordinate, idle talkers, deceivers, and divisive. Paul warns Titus of men there who profess to know God, but in their works, they're denying Him. So all of this is also happening. There are those in the assembly who profess to know God, they speak godly things, and yet by their works, they show that they have no fear of God, they are not honoring God, with their lives. And so in their very works, they're denying Him. Paul has told Titus to look out for these men. Needless to say, based on what we know from the letter itself, the Cretans have a poor reputation throughout all of the land. In chapter 1 of this letter, Paul says this to Titus. He says one of them, and he's speaking of the Cretans, one of them, a prophet of their own, said Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, and lazy gluttons. This testimony is true. Can you imagine the Apostle Paul inspired by the Spirit? They have one poet who's got it right. He says all Cretans are liars, evil beasts, and lazy gluttons. This testimony is true. Therefore, Paul says to Titus, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. So I want us to see the test that is set before Titus. He's a faithful minister of the Word of God. He's been left in confidence by Paul to teach these things to these people, and yet there's a lot of trouble in Crete. They're known for it. And and Titus is having to deal with that. In chapter 3, Paul gives godly instruction and counsel to Titus, telling him to continually teach these things to the Christians who are there. These, for us brethren this morning, are things worth Remembering Titus 3 and verse 1. Remind them to be subject to rulers and authorities to obey. To be ready for every good work. To speak evil of no one. To be peaceable, gentle, showing all humility to all men. For we ourselves were also once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But when the kindness and the love of God, our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to His mercy, He saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, that having been justified by His grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This is a faithful saying. And these things I want you to affirm constantly that those who have believed in God should be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable for men. We see here that it is good. These things are worth remembering. All of these things that Paul has given to us, he finishes by saying those who believe in God should be careful to maintain 
good works. All of these things are good and profitable to men. So it's worth it for us as New Testament Christians to read it, to study it, and to understand it. It is good, Paul says, to be reminded of these things. This is the hardest it's ever been for me to click this clicker with a, with a bad thumb. It's good to be reminded of things that are wholesome and that are right. Isn't that true? Think about the, the parent. And for those kids who are here today, how many times... <laughs> I already sound like my dad. How many times have you heard this the phrase, how many times do I have to tell you? What is the point of that question? The children don't know. Were they supposed to keep count? The parents don't know. I know that because I'm a parent. I say to my kids, how many times have I told you? I'm glad my boys aren't here today because I, it's, it's interesting to me that I, you know, at any point they go, I don't know how many. I'd be like, oh, I don't know, I don't know. Too many, that's the answer, too many. So what's the point? Why do parents say that to children? How many times do I have to tell you? Number one is the child should feel some level of embarrassment. This has been said to me before. And not just once. And I'm embarrassed because my parents are frustrated that they're having to say it to me again. They've told me, and they've told me, and they've told me, and here we are. It still hasn't been done. It still hasn't been fixed. And so there is a point to that, isn't there? That those, there's no number. And if they gave me a number, I, I wouldn't know what to do with that. But anything over one is too many, right? And yet we have to. So, so the point is, how many times do I have to tell you? The point is, if you're a loving parent, you're going to keep telling them. Because it's wholesome, and it's right, and they need to know it, and they need to do it. Because it's good for them, not because you're angry, but because it's good for them. We're trying to mold them and turn them into all that God has designed them to be, and He's put them in subjection to us. And so, they are to be subject to us. We're not looking for the exact number of times. We want you to know that we've gone over this, and you should be growing from that, not stuck here. We should be moving on. Paul says in chapter 3 and verse 1, now remind them. How many times do I have to tell you, be subject to rulers and to authorities and obey? Paul is writing this to Titus under the rule of Nero. The greatest persecution that the church has seen up until this point by an existing government is happening right now. Paul is a Roman citizen and he says, be subject to rulers and authorities, obey them. That is amazing. Peter will say this in 1 Peter 2, beginning in verse 13. Therefore submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether to the king is supreme or to governors, as to those who are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. It is God's will that we submit to the authority, the authority and the governing body that reigns and rules over us. And, and Peter too, under the rule of Nero. Both Peter and Paul, as we understand it. Church history, that's which is recorded for us. Both Peter and Paul have spent time in the Mamertine prison in Rome. Not for doing wrong for serving God. So we have both Peter and Paul who have told us to be subject to rulers and authorities, and yet they will go to prison for not being subject to rulers and authorities. And for us, we need to understand why that is true. For two apostles writing inspired by the Holy Spirit saying, you subject yourself to governing authorities and they themselves will be cast into prison because they refused to subject themselves to the governing authorities or to the authorities that existed and had issue with what they were teaching. There came a point where both of them understood that it was not right to obey men rather than God. Many of you will remember in Acts chapter 4, I'd like to read that for you. Acts chapter 4, 
Peter and John are standing before the council. Acts chapter 4 and verse 18. The council called them and commanded them not to speak at all nor teach in the name of Jesus. Now we have a problem. But Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it is right in the sight of God, not you, not you, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than God, you judge. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. And they stood in opposition against the authorities, the council, the ruling authorities that existed at that time. Again, in the, in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 26. Well, watch Paul here speaking to King Agrippa. Acts 26 and verse 27. Watch what he says. And remember with me that Paul is in chains. He's standing before the king. Acts 26 and verse 27. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you believe. Then Agrippa said to Paul, you almost persuade me to become a Christian. Paul is chained. Watch what he says next. And Paul said, I would to God that not only you, but also all who hear me today might become both almost and altogether such as I am, except for these chains. This is an important picture for us because we get upset about the government and the governing authorities and the things that are being said. We, we are in front of a news cycle that the world has never seen before. If you sit in front of the television all day, you're going to get pounded with whatever the news world thinks is relevant. You may have heard of a hostage that has been set free recently. If you had your TV on in the last two or three days, you've heard about it. It is being crammed down our throats. This is what matters. This is what should matter to you. And we get upset. And I understand why. But we need to look into the New Testament. We need to watch what God approves of. Paul is chained by the Roman government. He has an opportunity to speak to the king, and he doesn't express to him why he's innocent and that these things, none of these things should have come to pass upon me. I'm a good man. No, he tells him what Jesus told him to do. He tells him his response to what Jesus told him to do and that now the Jews have become upset because of his teaching that they believe opposes Moses. And as he explains these things to the king, the king is on the fence. He's thinking, man, He's right. I know what the prophets say. And everything he has said so far is right. There was a prophecy of the Christ coming into the world and he's telling me that he's come. And then Paul says, do you believe? I know that you believe. So again, put us there to stand before a judge, someone who's got you in there. You're on trial because you're a Christian. You've been a good example to the people around you. You love your fellow man. You are a good person by all measures. And yet you're on trial not because of what you've done wrong, but because you refuse to do that which is wrong and is now accepted. And which one of us would have the courage to say, if there's any chance that you would believe in God, come to the truth. Your soul is precious. It's worth more than all the world. I know why I'm here. And I'll see the end that God has intended for me. But your soul is worth considering these things. And then the judge will do whatever they do. They send you off probably to be hanged or whatever because you're still a Christian and you haven't uh, rejected those things publicly. So you answer for that. But to say, I would to God that not only you, but all those who hear me would be altogether such as I am, except for the unjust punishment which is upon me. What a Christ like perspective! Jesus himself, after being severely beaten, did not scream at Pilate, bludgeoned by Romans did not scream at Pilate. He did not cuss at him. And he didn't condemn the Roman government. He humbled himself before his God. Is that who we are? When we talk about the government that we live under today, we need to be careful with throwing our hands up in disgust every time we mention our government or the mention of our government finds its way into conversation. We don't want to become snarly in our attitudes. That does not glorify Jesus Christ. We are Christians. And we have a commandment from the Lord to obey our rulers and our authorities. We're not anarchists. 
We're not revolutionaries. We're Christians. Don't, don't get confused. We serve the true and living God. We are not rebel forces trying to survive the oppression of the first order. We are children of God and we know where we stand in all things. That is a special place to be. Now, having said that, if a law is passed that prevents me from praying with my family or teaching my children about God, we have a problem. I will never, ever stop because I believe in Him and I believe in His promise. I will adhere to the law. Speed limit. I don't steal things from grocery stores. I do what is right. I understand the law. I uphold that law because it's God's will. But if the government tells me I can't teach my children about God, we're done here. You're going to have to come and get me because it's not going to stop. As a matter of fact, I'm going to ramp it up because trouble is upon us and my children need to know about it while they have me in the presence of the home. If I am taught or if I receive an email or a letter is sent to this building saying that the Word of God from the New Testament can no longer be proclaimed, we have a problem. I will be here on Sunday morning and I will do my job. And I pray that you come too. But if you're not here, I will be. You have my Word. I have a responsibility before God to see this through. Be subject to to rulers. Be ready, Paul says in that same verse. Be ready for every good work. Paul mentions good works six times in these three chapters of Titus. Throughout the letter, he tells Titus things like this. You be a pattern of good works. You yourself, be a pattern of good works. He tells him later, Christ gave Himself that we might be zealous for good works. Why did Christ die on the cross? So that we would be zealous for good works. And he tells Titus, those who have believed in God should be careful to maintain good works. We read that this morning. He also says to us in our reading, speak evil of no one. That's the beginning of verse 2. Speak evil of no one. Speak evil of no one. It is very hard to keep our tongues under control at all times. I am to speak evil of no man at any time. And I struggle with this, honestly. And, and usually, what I've realized is usually when I fail at this, you know, speaking evil of someone, it's usually because Yell was egging me on. So it's not my fault. I had a list of names I was going to use. I chose you. There's several here who egg me on. <clears throat> but isn't that right? That's all we need. We just need somebody to go, do you see that? There we go. All I needed was the door to open so I could speak evil of someone. And it's hard to guard ourselves against that. The Bible's clear. We're never to speak evil of anyone. If you have a problem with someone or you think someone's in sin or they're committing evil, go to them. Not, not speak about them. Go to them. That'll tell us where we are in our own evaluation of that person. Because if I'm not willing to go to that person and warn them about the evil they're involved in, then I shouldn't be talking about it to anyone. It is true. It'll always be true. It's so easy to turn to someone I'm friends with and say, let me tell you something. And speak evil of someone, and the Bible has told me to do it to no one. And we need to watch this because as Paul continues to give this explanation of speaking evil of no one, there's an attitude of heart. There's a way that we should be. He says, be peaceable, be gentle, and be humble with all men. Peaceable. Let peace be reigning in your life. You are at peace personally yourself. You're not tormented within. You're at peace because of who God is, because of His message, and because Christ gives us His peace. And so we're, we're peaceful people. And James tells us, about this peace. He says the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. The fruit of righteousness is sown in peace. If I myself am not peaceful, I'll never be able to sow the fruit of righteousness in peace. I should be looking for opportunities to make peace. And then he says, be gentle. 
be peaceable among, among all people around you and be gentle. That's an important word for us. What an amazing word, gentle. Think about a, a, a small child, two or three years old, and you hand them a, a newborn uh, puppy. And they've never handled or pet an animal before. And so you say, here's our new dog. You know What, what do you say to them? Be gentle. Because they'll be carrying that thing around by its ear if you don't tell them, be gentle. Well, what does be gentle mean? Well, don't carry it by its ear. Why not? Well, let me carry you by your ear and you tell me. Right? To the three or the four-year-old. Be gentle. And so what are they supposed to do? We tell them, sit down. Don't, don't pick this thing up while you're standing up. Have a seat and, and cur curl your arms like this. Get your arms, get your arms ready. How about a newborn baby that you hand to the older sibling who's only one or two years old? Can I hold them? Oh, yes. We're family. Please sit on the couch. We put pillows around them. Be gentle. Be gentle. This is your brother. This is your sister. Be gentle to them. I found an injured bird one time when I was about 10 years old. The bird was under a car by my house. And uh, I was not gentle at 10 years old. And I wanted to catch that bird so bad, it like broken wing, hobbling around, and I was running on both sides of the car trying to scare it one side so I could grab it on the other side. And My dad came out at one point and, and, and said, you should probably leave that bird alone. And I said, but I want to help it. I'm going to train it. I'm going to raise it. I'm going to feed it. And he said, no. No, you're not. Leave the bird alone. And in hindsight, when I think about that moment, there's no way I could have helped that poor bird. What that bird needed was a veterinarian, someone who knows how to be gentle, and that was not me. But we know, and how many times do we burst through the doors of a situation not gentle at all? We need to be rough, we need to be harsh, because we want to get our point across. They need to know where I'm coming from, and if I don't get serious and be strong and pressure them, They'll never get the point. And so I justify acting like an animal in a situation where I should have said, you're important to me, and I want to tell you what you need to know because I love you. That's gentle. That is calm. That is peaceful. And on top of all that, he says, be humble. Be humble. And it's an important thing for us to remember that we must humble ourselves before we can be humble to people around us. That has to be done in-house. Jesus told His disciples, whoever humbles himself as a little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Paul says, be humble with all men. And I, I don't want us to get the impression that Paul's saying, you know, be weak. Uh, just, just fall over every time somebody comes up with a new idea. Just, just give in to everything that comes your way. It's not weak. It's meek. Be meek. The first song that we sang this morning, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Jesus says to us, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Jesus describing himself, gentle and meek. And he says, come to me, learn from me. There's great value there, and we should be determined to do that. Down in verse 3 of Titus chapter 3, For we ourselves were also once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and every envy, hateful and hating one another. It, Paul is fond of doing this. He says to us typically and often, do these things, be this kind of person, and don't you forget. Doesn't he do that to us? He does it for himself as well. He says, I... I, of all Christians, I am the chief among all sinners. Of all those who receive the grace of Christ, I am the chief of sinners. He has no issue with saying that about himself because he knows who he was and he knows who God had called by His grace. He's saying to us, do not forget who you were before God found you and cleansed you because that's important when we go to speak to a lost and dying world. You're not better than they are. You are not better than they are. You have found the Lord God and He has washed you and cleansed you and you are precious in His sight. You are His child. 
You are better because of Him. Not because of you. And so Paul goes down this list. And it's amazing to me because Paul was a Pharisee of the strictest sect. He studied the law constantly. And look what he says. We ourselves. He's including him. Look at the Apostle Paul with me and see if he fits this. A Jew, a Pharisee of the strictest sect who kept the law in every way. He was foolish, a student of the law. He was foolish. He was disobedient. He was deceived. He served various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hating and hateful. Paul. And he includes us. We were as well. And imagine now, if you, again, go to someone who's lost. Let's just say your boss or a family member of yours. You're going to go to them and talk to them about uh, their lost condition. And you say to them, you know what your problem is? I'll tell you. You are foolish. You are disobedient. Imagine talking to your boss this way. You are deceived. You are serving various lusts and pleasures. You live in malice and you live in envy. You are hateful and you hate others. That's your problem. What's the next thing you're going to hear? You're fired. So that's not what we do, is it? We know that doesn't work. We speak to them about the great hope that God has provided, that they can be saved from their lost condition. Paul's not speaking to the lost here, is he? He's speaking to those who were lost, and he's giving them extra reason to be humble, to be peaceful, to be gentle. God has been gentle, peaceful, and kind to us, and we should do the same for others. Verse 4, and here's the beautiful picture of it all. But when the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done. So he's saying it to us again. Not, not because of you. Not, not because of me, but according to His mercy. That is a giant word. According to His mercy. He could have said according to His judgment. But where would that have left us? You see, God came to us according to His mercy. If it was judgment, we would all be toast. But according to His mercy, He saved us. We didn't save ourselves. He saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior. And having been justified by His grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. What a promise. We are heirs of the hope of eternal life. Romans 5 talks to us about hope. Verses 5-11 through 11, and what that means for the New Testament Christian. Verse 8, this is a faithful saying, and these things I want you to affirm constantly. Brothers and sisters in Christ, that's what I've tried to do this morning. To affirm these things constantly. We need them. We have a world out there that will begin to pick us apart the second we leave here. And so these things are to be affirmed. We are to be reminded. We are to get back in that place and to equip ourselves with the living Word of God so that we are prepared to do it His way and to be blessed in that effort. Paul says this is a faithful saying five times in First and Second Timothy and Titus. And this is the final time that we see, see it written in the New Testament. 1 Timothy 1.15, just listen to what these are tied to. 1 Timothy 1.15, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. It's a faithful saying. 1 Timothy 3 and verse 1, this is a faithful saying. If a man desires the position of a bishop, he desires a good work. Just imagine the magnitude this is a faithful saying. If a man desires, a man looks at a congregation and sees the need for leadership, for elders to be in place, and his heart is drawn towards that, not away from it, not away from the issues and the troubles that all of us bring to the table, but drawn toward it, led by God, to be a servant of God, to be a servant of the church. Paul says, and I just want you to see it, it's a faithful saying, if he desires the position of a bishop, he desires a good work. 1 Timothy 4, verses 8-9. through 9, 
Bodily exercise profits little, but godliness is profitable for all things, having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance. 2 Timothy 2, verses 11 through 13. This is a faithful saying. For if we died with him, we shall also live with him. If we endure, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. That is a faithful saying. And the final one we have here is Titus chapter 3 and verse 8. We'll read it one more time together. Titus 3 and verse 8. This is a faithful saying, and these things I want you to affirm constantly, that those who have believed in God, that's us, those who have believed in God should be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable to men. The lesson is yours, brothers and sisters in Christ. The lesson for this morning, I hope and pray that these things are an encouragement to you, that you have gained something from this study and from these words of our God. We have a tall order. We have a great responsibility set before us today. If Jesus Christ returns today, or even in your lifetime, you are a part of the last generation of all of human history. We need to see it that way. I'm the last. I am the remnant. I believe in God. And I see a world who hates Him. It is a great call. It is a great charge. May we not behave like worldly people, but like children of God. We need to respond to the Gospel. It's a great opportunity to do that. To be a child of God. To have your sins washed. Jesus died to save sinners, not to condemn them. If you need to come forward and make that known to this local church, please do that while together we stand and sing to encourage you.